जय राधा माधवा गुंज बिहारे जय राधा गुंज बिहारे हे धैय गोपी जनवा गिरी भव धाय गोपी जनवा गिरी भव धे सौरनंदन भज जन अंजनायसौरनंदन भज जन अंजनाय जमुन थीर Bhagavatam, Canto Two, Chapter Two, Text Thirty-Seven. The Lord in the Heart. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. ये भगवता 
पिबाते ये भगवता आत्मनम सतम कतम रितम श्रावण भूते शु संब्रितम पुरांति ते विसया विदुषिता सयम Rajanti tat charna saro rohanti kam. Pivanti ye bhagavata atmanam satam. Katam ritam shravanam puteshu sam ritam. Punanti te vishaya vidu sita sayam. Vrajanti tat charna saro ruhanti kam. Ladies. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> Pibanti, who drink, yea, those, Bhagavata, of the personality of Godhead, Atmanam, of the most dear, Satam, of devotees, Kata Amritam, the nectar of the messages. Shravana Putesu. Within the ear holes. Samritam. Fully filled. Punanti. Purified. Te. Thir, there. Visaya. Material enjoyment. Vidusita asayam. Polluted aim of life. Vrajanti, do go back. Tat, the Lord's. Charana, feet. Saroruha amtikam, near the lotus. Translation, those who drink through oral reception, fully filled with the nectarian message of Lord Krishna, the beloved of the devotees, 
purify the polluted aim of life known as material enjoyment and thus go back to Godhead, to the lotus feet of Him, the personality of Godhead. Srila mm. Prabhupada's purport. The suffering of human society is are due to the polluted aim of life. Here you go. Just think about that first line. The sufferings of human society are due to a polluted aim of life. So that means the aim of life is wrong, polluted, contaminated, and therefore suffering. Namely, and what is that? Namely, lording it over the material resources. So there's the answer. It's the polluted aim of life is to try to lord it over and control the material resources. The more human society engages in the exploitation of undeveloped material resources for sense gratification, the more it will be entrapped by the illusionary material energy of the Lord. And thus, the distress of the world will be intensified instead of diminished. Okay. Now there is a nice explanation. Everything is said here. That the resources of the law of the world are you meant for developing the needs that we need to live by? But when people exploit them and use them in excess in order to enjoy various types of sense gratification, that same energy which can supply the needs becomes a trap for the illusionary conditioned souls and then they suffer in that hard struggle to control and to enjoy. And instead of the aim of life being enhanced, the aim of life is being diminished. <laughs> the human necessities of life are fully supplied by the Lord in the shape of, so now Prabhupada lists a whole series of things that God automatically gives to the material nature. Food grains, milk, fruit, wood, stone, sugar, silk, Jewels, cotton, salt, vegetables, water, etc. In sufficient quantities to feed and care for the human race of the world as well as the living beings on each and every planet of the universe. So everything is supplied by the Lord in abundance and is always extra. The supply source is complete. And only a little energy by the human being is required to get the necessities into the proper channel. So there now Prabhupada will explain what we do to put these human resources. There is no need of machines or tools or used steel plants or artificial creating comforts of life. Life is never made more comfortably by artificial means but by a plain living and high thinking. So he sums up everything up. Plain living and high thinking. What does plain living mean? Plain living means to live according to your needs. Mm -hmm. What is necessary to keep the body and soul together. And that's mentioned in the first verse of the Sri Yashupanisham. Ishavasham midam sarvam yatkinchat tigam jagat Tena jaktena bundi jaha magridaha kusiswedanam. That we are meant to live by the grace of the Lord that is supplied through the material energy and everything is there in abundance to live nicely and happily. Unfortunately, the human being is not satisfied with the basics and therefore they go on trying to control material energy by creating more and more unnecessary things in life. Simply to occupy people's attention and of course the main reason is for some few people to make large amounts of money based on creating things people don't need. <laughs> There's a statistic and that statistic is that in America, the United States of America, there is called what is called the Patent Office. I don't know if you know what a Patent Office is. A Patent Office is, a, is an office that approves things to go on the market to be sold to the general mass of people. So before you can put a product on the market, it has to go through an approval system first. 
And so, and that patent office is very busy. <laughs> Every week, approximately 250 new items come to the patent office to be put on the market. Gin, and people are always thinking of new things to create so they can sell it, make some money, and therefore think that they have made some progress. But most of the stuff, actually the statistics are that today, as opposed to the year 1850, when life was considered to be more simplified, although the Industrial Revolution was in progress, it hadn't developed to the point where it was now. But 1850, 95% of the things that people want, would require to live, such as food, silk, cotton to make clothing, uh, medical needs, education, basic things, homes, 95% was considered to be necessities. In other words, what was available on the common market was 95% and they were necessities. And 5% was considered to be luxuries or extras. And now we have the statistics switched around. <laughs> now, it's 95% of the stuff on the market you can actually do without and still be able to live, when we say, healthy and wholesome. And 5% now are considered to be necessities. So you can see what is the progress of human society is just to create more things to distract people and ultimately to divert people away from the real goal of life, self-realization. So Prabhupada always used to make this statement, live simple living, high thinking. Nowadays people are too busy thinking to stop to live. <laughs> too many things to do, too many things, places to go, too many things to see, new things on the market. And uh, life has become quite chaotic. Chaotic. And you can see, especially in the big cities, there's always so much noise, so much pollution, so much unnecessary things. And simple living, I thinking, is just a, a euphemism that people like to say, but nobody is moving in that direction, except a few. Except a few. So in 1977, Srila Prabhupada, he, uh, he started to speak more about what he wanted our society to focus on as far as the future of both of the world, he was thinking about people in general also, and the ISKCON society. He said, build these farm communities. Build these farm communities. Grow your own food, keep cows, uh, produce uh, milk products, uh, live simply, uh, make your own cloth, grow cotton, grow silk. Um, said, make your own houses. Prabhupada came to the New Vrindavan community in 1976, and uh, he was talking about the same ideas, about more simple living. And he said, he said, you're rich by nature here. We were in a farm community. We were surrounded by, you know, a very rural environment, and there were so many herbs available. We hadn't developed agriculture to, the, to an extent, but it was in the process. And Prabhupada said, uh, build your own houses. He said, you don't have to, you know, call in these big construction companies to be, build these big houses. And he just showed, he drew in on paper, he called it a little simple house. Two floors and just enough for four people or more, four or five people in the house. Very simple, can be easily done. There's a community in America called the Amish, and they can build a house in one or two days. <laughs> a house that is sufficient to live a whole family. And they're more of a community because they're also based, they're also religious based. <laughs> and uh, they work together and build their own houses. They grow their own food and they simply don't rely so much 
on the outside world. They don't even have cars, they have horses and buggies. <laughs> of course, we don't have to go back to that, but it's actually much more cleaner for the environment in the general sense also. So Prabhupada talked about that. So I'll continue. And Prabhupada goes on, the highest perfection think, perfectional thinking of human society is suggested here by Sukadeva Goswami, namely sufficient hearing of Srimad Bhagavatam. For men in this age of Kali, when they have lost the perfect vision of life, this Srimad Bhagavatam is the torchlight by which to see the path. So when everything is dark, you need light in order to move along the way, the way and of course go in the, the right way at the same time. And Bhagavatam is both the light and the direction that one has to go in. So everything is there in Srimad Bhagavatam. Prabhupada will go on. For men in this age of Kali, when they have lost the perfect vision of life, this Srimad Bhagavatam is the torchlight by which to see the real path. Srila Jiva Goswami Prabhupada has commented, commented on the Katamritam mentioned in this verse and has indicated Srimad Bhagavatam to be the nectarian message of the Personality of Godhead. By sufficient hearing of Srimad Bhagavatam, the polluted aim of life, namely lorded over matter, will subside and the people in general in all parts of the world be able to live in a peaceful life of knowledge and bliss simply by following and living according to the directions of Srimad Bhagavatam. For a pure devotee of the Lord, any topics in relationship with his name, fame, quality, entourage, etc. are all pleasing. And because such topics have been approved by great devotees like Narata, Hanuman, Nanda Maharaj and others, inhabitants of Vrindavan, certainly such messages are transcendental and pleasing to the heart and soul. So not only the messenger are there, but they have been authorized by great souls who live according to these same principles that they teach. And by the constant hearing of the message of the Bhagavad Gita and later Srimad Bhagavatam, one is assured herein by Srila Sukadeva Goswami that he will reach the personality of Godhead and render him transcendental loving service in the spiritual plat planet of the name Goloka Vindavan, which resembles a huge lotus flower. Thus, by the process of Bhakti Yoga, directly accepted as suggested in this verse by sufficient hearing of the transcendental message of the Lord, the material contamination is directly eliminated without one's attempting to contemplate and Prabhupada goes on to say what we shouldn't contemplate, the impersonal Virat conception of the Lord. And by practicing bhakti yoga, if the performer is not purified from the material conception, he must be a pseudo-devotee, Haribo. That's a good one, huh? So if you're practicing bhakti yoga and you still, you know, got a big load of material contamination, and yeah, something's wrong. <laughs> For such an imposter, Prabhupada gets pretty right to the point, there is no remedy for being freed from the material entanglement. Omagyan timirandasya gyanajana salakaya chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri guravena maha maum vishnu vadaya krishna pristaya bhutale shimakti bhakti vedanta swami iti namine Namaste, Saraswati Devi Gaudavani Pachari Nirvase Sasunyavari Paschatya Te Satarna Yala Prabhupada Ki Jai. So, life is simple, but it has been made complicated by modern life. Life is simple. Chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> Read some nice books about the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Talk about it amongst the other devotees and learn more about our relationship with the Lord. And this hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord is mentioned as the essence of bhakti. Satam prasangam mamavirya sambhido bhavanti ritkarna rasayana kata. 
that this hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, because the glories of the Lord are not on the material platform. They are completely transcendental and they're saturated with all of the qualities of the Lord. His, his names, his qualities, his, his forms, his pastimes, his entourage, the nature of his doms, all of these things make up the transcendental nature of the topics that are glorified in relationship to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And becoming absorbed, or at least giving quality time every day to that, one will become completely happy. Here's the formula for happiness. Everybody's trying to become happy, right? And there's, no, there's so many new books, how to become happy, how to become successful, how to use your mind in the right way, how to neglect what's, what's supposed to be neglected so you don't get confused. And there's so many self-help books. And people can't, can't understand the simple process of just hear and chant the glories of the Lord. Because this hearing and chanting goes right to the soul. The soul is awakened because the soul is by nature full of the glorifications of the Lord. And that's that, that uh, current of transcendental sound vibration taps into that unlimited source of glories and it just awakens the soul's nature. And one becomes happy. <laughs> Becoming happy is easy. <laughs> Of course, living in the material world is not easy <laughs> because people have complicated life so much that they've made the simple turn into the difficult. And, but chant and hear and chant the glories of the Lord as much as possible. And that will, and as it says in that same verse, that is the essence and also the path of perfection towards the goal of light, which is to reach pure love of God. Now here's the formula. And Bhagavatam, what is Bhagavatam? It's all about hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. We have the Bhagavatam speaker, Sukadev Goswami, and the hearer of Bhagavatam, Maharaj Pariksit. Maharaj Pariksit was apparently cursed by a Brahmin boy for some little transgression of etiquette. He failed to, what we say, properly recognize a great soul and he 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 was hungry or thirsty he was traveling he stopped at the hermitage of Samak Rish and he uh, wanted some water but the Rish was in meditation and didn't notice the king and the king because this was highly unusual for 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 for, for Pariksha Maharaj to act like this but he did and he took a dead snake that was lying there and picked it up with his uh, sword and put it on the on the sage and left. When the word got back to his son, Shringi, that this is what happened to his father, he cursed Maharaj Pariksha. And that was the downfall of Brahminical culture. That led to the, to the caste system and the whole deviations of Brahmins to become more like... Uh, uh, persons who are interested in, in attaining material gain through performing Brahminical activities. In other words, doing pujas for money, uh, taking birth in a Brahminical family means you had to, you, know, you were automatically a Brahmin. All of these deviations in the whole Van Ashram system started with this curse by the Shringi. But, Maharaj Pariksit, when he heard about the curse, he was powerful. He was a great king and he was also a, a great devotee of the Lord. He could have counteracted the curse, but he didn't. He didn't counteract the curse. So some people will think, well, why didn't he? <laughs> you know, he was leading the world. The world was really living according to religious principles. Kali Yuga was looking for a way in. And when Maharaj Pariksit chastised the personality of Kali, he gave him no place to stay. And Kali was just looking for places where he could do his uh, mischief. But he couldn't find any place. So uh, 
Maharaj Pariksha gave him a place where there's a hoarding of gold. And that was hardly being done. But Kali wanted to get back. So he used this Brahmin boy, this inexperienced boy. He was, he was 12 years old and he was proud of being a Brahmana and he wanted to show off to his friends his Brahmatejas, his power. And so he did. By doing that, he cursed the king unnecessarily. There was no reason for it. In fact, Shamaka Rish, when he heard about that, he chastised his son for acting in a wrong way. And he said, now you've ruined everything. But the point is that Maharaj Pariksit, I mean, he, he accepted the curse. Why? Here is the chance to become purified and go back home, back to Godhead. He simply sat down and waiting for, he was fasting till death. And then of course, all the great sages from all over the, the universe were coming to see this powerful king who was once the ruler of the world, had given up everything, his family, his home, his, his occupation, his ministers, his treasury, everything, simply to hear, to, to fast until death. And, uh, but then they all came to offer some suggestion. But then when Sukadeva Goswami, he came, then it was understood, here is the remedy that was needed. And then, of course, Maharaj Pariksit heard for seven days the, the, the narrations of Srimad Bhagavatam. So here's an, this is the prime indication, both of the quality of what Bhagavatam has to offer in terms of transcendental knowledge and the enthusiasm of a, of a, a devotee to hear Bhagavatam. So Bhagavatam, we should fill the ears with the, with the sound vibrations of Bhagavatam because it is all about the name, fame, form, qualities, pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Srila Prabhupada, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, He did so many things to spread Krishna consciousness. And he opened temples, He initiated devotees, He, gave, he met very important people. But one of the main things that He did was He translated the Bhagavatam into the English language and gave the Bhaktivedanta purports which were relevant to people in the Western world. In other words, he explained that transcendental knowledge to those who are somewhat deficient for understanding this great science. So he made it easy by explaining the knowledge that was already there given by the previous acharyas and adding his realization according to the Western climate. And Prabhupada was famous for that. He spent hours every night, actually he spent usually about four hours a night translating Srimad Bhagavatam, starting at midnight when everybody else was sleeping. And Prabhupada wanted the time where he could simply focus. I mean, he, did, he wanted it he could have did it. He could have planned it another time, but he did it when it was complete quiet, when there was no one else around. Where he could simply absorb himself in understanding what he needed to write for making his Bhagavatam, you know, the foundation for the power, the whole execution of bhakti for our Iskon society and ultimately for the world in general. And Prabhupada was so precise. There's a story where when one time Prabhupada was here in India and it was he was he was doing his translated and everyone was sleeping. It was in the middle of the night. And then sometimes if Prabhupada needed some assistance, he would ring his bell. His servant would stay outside the room and then he would be sleeping and when he heard the bell ring he would come in to see what Prabhupada wanted. So one time Prabhupada rang the bell and uh, the servant came in, sat there waiting for Prabhupada to speak. And Prabhupada said, you hear that sound? And he couldn't hear anything. He said, Prabhupada, what sound? Prabhupada said, listen. He was listening as, as hard as he could. 
no sound. Somewhere there's a fan and it's making this sound click, 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 click. And Prabhupada could hear it. It was a distance away. And he said, that's disturbing. <laughs> so find out where it's coming from <laughs> and stop it. <laughs> So I guess that was not an easy service to do because he could hardly hear the sound himself. But Prabhupada's hearing was so precise that he actually wanted complete silence, absolute silence, pin drop silence, so he could absorb himself because he knew this was the, one of the most important part of his mission because he knew after some time he wouldn't be here, but he wanted to leave with himself in the form he wanted to leave Krishna in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam, not only for the devotees, but for the world in general. Because simply by, in the Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati makes a nice point. Bhakti Vinod Thakur also makes a nice point. It's actually Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he says, that if you take all the books of the world and you burn them, and there's only Srimad Bhagavatam left, there's no loss. <laughs> There's no loss. Because everything is there. You might say, well, that's nice, but what about practical things? It's also there in Bhagavatam. All of the practicality you need just to live, you can find it in the Srimad Bhagavatam. If you carefully read, Prabhupada said, everything's there. All the activities, all the subject matters that make up the human culture, which are required for the, the human culture to to live and to progress, you can find it in Srimad Bhagavatam. Everything is there. And Prabhupada spoke on so many of these different topics, but he all connected it to Krishna. And that's the, the essential thing. Everything was connected to Krishna and to the process of worshiping Krishna through devotional service. So this Bhagavatam is the, the essence of everything. And so if we take time every day to hear at least for one hour and Prabhupada was, was talking one time he was actually Prabhupada, somebody asked Srila Prabhupada a question Srila Prabhupada how will we associate with you once you leave the world pretty difficult question to ask a person who's still around <laughs> But Prabhupada wasn't disturbed by the question and he actually took an opportunity to answer it in a way. He said, he said, I'm in my books. Read my books. He said, if you read my books, you can, we, you can associate with me through my books. And then, of course, he also said at different other occasions, these books are my transcendental ecstasy. And Prabhupada would read his own books. Sometimes he would call the devotees together in the evening and he would sit there and say, give me Krishna book. They would bring him Krishna book and Prabhupada would be reading it and he'd be laughing. <laughs> and he'd be commenting. He said, and Prabhupada, it's like Prabhupada was reading the book for the first time, although he was the author of the book. <laughs> because he was actually experiencing Krishna's words coming through him. And Prabhupada would say that, I, I'm not writing these books. It's Krishna speaking, I'm putting the words on paper, that's all. These words are Krishna's words. And so, the, and so when Prabhupada said that, I was thinking, I had heard that, that Prabhupada said, I'm in my books, you read my books, you can associate with me. So one day, I was in my room, this was in the United States, I was in, I was the, in, in Chicago in the temple, and I was just reading Bhagavatam. And I was reading, reading for about two hours, just, just reading. It was nectar. And then something happened. I wasn't reading the words anymore. I was hearing the words being spoken by Prabhupada as I was reading it. In other words, it was like listening to a tape lecture of Prabhupada reading, speaking. And so I was 
As I was reading, I could hear Prabhupada speak every word that I was reading. And it went on for some time. And I thought, you know, I mean, this was really an experience. And then it stopped. And it never happened to me again, only once. So Prabhupada wanted to say, I'm in my books, don't you believe me? <laughs> so, yeah, and so I'm there, he, he's there. And we can actually associate with him directly through these books, which means to associate with the pure sound vibration. And these words, Prabhupada told one devotee, he said, uh, if you read, he was referring to nectar devotion. He said, if you read just one page, one page of nectar devotion, you can be fully self-realized. And then he said, no, actually only one paragraph. And then he stopped for a while and said, actually only one line is needed. If you just read just one line, you can become fully self-realized. And then he said, actually only one word. <laughs> so is he exaggerating or trying to make some kind of, you know, you know, play on words? Actually, no, Prabhupada was saying, that this, this sound vibration is pure, it's coming from the spiritual world. And those who hear with rapt attention, and that is a quality for hearing, because hearing actually becomes complete when one is fully attentive to the sound as being spoken or being read then one can actually enter into the sound vibration of what in other words the meaning starts to become more and more revealed through that just like Prabhupada one time Prabhupada, the devotees asked Prabhupada this was uh, this was the Brahma Samhita <laughs> the prayers by Lord Brahma and Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada's Guru Maharaj had written a commentary a purport on each of the verses. Now Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's English was university English, high fluten English, with which most people can't understand, even if you're English, even if you're not, even if you understand English, if you're brought up in an English country and you've been speaking all English all your life, most people can't understand. You need a dictionary. So, the devotees were trying to read Bhakti Siddhanta's uh, commentaries and they, they were struggling. So they said to Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, could you write a commentary on your spiritual master's uh, purports in, ba in ba Brahma Samhita? Prabhupada said, no. <laughs> he said, you read it over and over and over. You repeatedly read and as you repeatedly read it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. And same with any of this transcendental knowledge. When the more you read it, the more that the, the, the meaning starts to surface. Of course there are many meanings. Each, each purport, each line, each paragraph has so many meanings to it. And as Prabhupada said, Try to understand this knowledge from different angles of vision, not only from one way. Now this is Bhagavatam, it is complete. It is Krishna in sound vibration. When Krishna left the planet, it is explained in one verse in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, that Krishna left himself in the form of Bhagavatam. Now as we hear this message every day, not only for a small Bhagavatam class, but we should take it up as a as a as a project to read and hear and study Srimad Bhagavatam. Because then simply by doing that you can actually become fully fully enriched with the transcendental sound vibration that awakens your attraction to Krishna. 
And as, as that attraction to Krishna awakens, we become fully attached to the Lord in devotional service. And then the emotions of the loving devotional service start to awaken and one becomes attached to Krishna in loving devotional service. So these, these books are really very powerful. And Prabhupada, he's making two points in this particular purport. One, we don't need all of the things that society has put, given us. If we live more of a simple lifestyle, depend on nature, and organize based on that, and Prabhupada says, and direct that, and live, live accordingly, then we have time, and this is the point, for hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. And Prabhupada was in India when he was uh, beginning his movement then. He was producing his Back to Godhead magazine. Now it's a magazine. At that time it was just one page. He would write an article and it would be two sides, one page, two sides. Prabhupada would write it and then he would edit it. He would bring it to the printer, have it printed pick up the copies and go to the tea stalls in Delhi and try to sell it there. And he would go to the people sitting in the different tea stalls and offer them this little bit of knowledge for one or two pice, really nothing. And Prabhupada was, was, was meeting the same situation all the time. People were saying, oh, Swamiji, what you're doing is very good, but we have no time. No dime, no dime. Too many things to do, too many, th too many responsibilities, no time. But Prabhupada was hearing that, oh, no time, so the next issue he wrote was called No Time. <laughs> People got time for everything but Krishna. <laughs> but even though those of us here, of course, we're making time for Krishna. But still, we find sometimes we don't have enough time to hear and chant, to associate with devotees, to take time to read the books, and to really understand deeper and, uh, and to practice Krishna consciousness. So Prabhupada wanted us to live a more simple lifestyle. And he also said that this Western civilization is finished. Now it's intervened into India and maybe some third world countries in order to somehow or other mechanicalize, industrialize, and technologicalize everything. But in the big countries where it's been going on for, for decades, it's falling apart. <laughs> and Prabhupada also said that. He said in 1973, he said in 50 years, the Western society will be finished. It's on record, you can hear it. <laughs> it's, and it's already going downhill now because it's an artificial lifestyle. And you can read in the, in the first canto, Prabhupada talks about this so much, how we need to move away from this dependence on the Western technological society and establish these farm communities with simple living, cow protection, agriculture, and more time for hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. Of course, that was part four of Srila Prabhupada's four-point mission to establish Krishna consciousness in the world. The first part was holy books and holy names, temples. The third part was educating people and initiating them and qualifying them to become Brahmins and executing devotional service. And the last part of his mission was the social environment by which to execute Krishna consciousness. So he said for every city temple, there should be a farm community. Of course, you have that here in Govardhan Echo Village. But mostly around the world, our society is somewhat bereft of these things. We haven't really put emphasis on this, but it is important. And it's also the, the, the style that is healthy. I remember I was here a couple years ago and um, the pollution in, in Mumbai was so bad. <laughs> I don't know what it is now. There's this called the Air Pollution Index. They have this rating system. And I was talking to one senior devotee and uh, I said, well, what is the normal number for the rating of the pollution index? He said 20, 25. 
And if it gets up to a hundred, then it's kind of dangerous. I said, well, what is the present? He said, 543 is the next. <laughs> You're looking at the sun, but what are you seeing? You're seeing some hazy cloud that's apparently over the sun, but it's not no cloud. It's simply the carbon monoxide coming from the different you know, machines that we have produced for advancement of human culture. <laughs> So yeah, so we're living in a very deficient and artificial society that is killing people's health, really. People's health are being destroyed. So Prabhupada wanted more of a, a lifestyle, he said, the way Krishna lived, village life. And of course you might think, oh my God, that's the way I grew up. Now I got a car, I got a computer, I got, I got my own watch, you know. Got all so many nice things that are produced by uh, this wonderful technological and super calibristic society that's doing so many nice things. And everything is convenient. I just push a button, I got a light, I plug in my command. But how long is it going to last? <laughs> and even though it's an artificial way, because we have no time for Krishna or not enough time for Krishna. So Prabhupada wanted this lifestyle. And basically the essence is agriculture. You see, grow your own food. He said, if you grow your own food, what we grow on our own farms, he said, is a hundred times more nutritious than what you buy in the stupid markets and the stores. Because it is free from the pesticides, herbicides, and all of the chemicals they destroy the soil with in order to rapidly produce crops and then the soil is destroyed they have to go to another area to look for another area to plant the next time so the society is 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 killing people really it's really killing people wholesale <laughs> with so many new devices by which you can somehow or other find some uh, novelty in, but it has nothing to do with health or with the needs of society. Anyway, that's the way society is organized because it's run by people who are simply exploiting material nature. Okay, and of course, back to Bhagavatam, Anasta Prayeshu Abhadrashim Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. Bhagavati Uttama Sloke, Bhaktir Bhavati Naistiki. Bhagavatam is like nourishment, it's food. It's not only that, it's medicine, al sadi it's medicine. It cures the disease, what is that disease? Bhavarog, material desire. And material desire is a disease that destroys the living entity's ability to find happiness and progress in this world. So read Srimad Bhagavatam, discuss Bhagavatam, make Bhagavatam the focus in your life. And Srila Prabhupada did that in making his mission, in bringing his mission to the world. He put Bhagavatam as one of his most important projects to bring Krishna consciousness into the world. Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada Ki So anyone would like to add a question, ask a question or comment? Comments, questions? Thank you, Maharaj, for the class. Your presence is purifying us. Maharaj, that last part of uh, Prabhupada's purport in which uh, Prabhupada is saying, by practicing Bhakti Yoga, if the performer is not purified from the material contamination, he must be a pseudo-devotee. <laughs> it's a pretty strong statement. Very strong statement. It's kind and of for like such a an sweeping impos- statement. You're either real or you're not. <laughs> and for such an imposter, there is no remedy for being freed from material entanglement. Mm-hmm. In other words, the process is simple, but what it means by pseudo devotee means that when you add something of your own ideas to the process, 
in order to gain something. In other words, Prabhupada said, the disease is personal, personal motivation. He said, this is the disease. This pollutes the process of bhakti. When we have our own personal motivation for performing devotional service. So, what is the formula? All right, the formula is simply to try to serve according to the directions given by the scriptures, by the spiritual master, by the acharyas, and don't try to get something material from bhakti. Some people, people worship Ganesh to get material things. People worship Durga to get power. People worship the sun to get health. People worship Lord Shiva to get liberation. But none of these things are included in, in bhakti yoga. We worship Krishna in order to purify ourselves, to come to the point of developing our innate quality of love for Krishna and ultimately go back to the spiritual world. The process is simple. Chant Hare Krishna, read books, associate with devotees, chant and dance. It's nice. <laughs> it's easy. But when you add your material contaminations, the material desires to it, and then you can't actually experience the natural simplicity that is coming by way of the of the execution of bhakti. Because your, your mind is diverted away from the essence by trying to fulfill material desires through execution of bhakti yoga. Mm -hmm. So that's what Prabhupada really means. Even that they're practicing but still they're still attached to their, their material desires and they're trying to fulfill material desires through bhakti. Mm -hmm. Bhakti can fulfill desires, but material desires are, are just a covering over our real desires. Material desires are not real, they're a shadow. A real desire is to hear and chant the glories of the Lord and to serve the Lord in devotion. That is the soul's desires. The mind creates all of these other desires due to the association of material energy. So a devotee has to just think, I may not be pure, I may have material desires, but I should not try to fulfill them. I should not act on them. Even though the opportunity may come to fulfill material desires, I should see this will this will damage or interfere with my progress in devotional service. That's all. So there's two kinds of pure devotees: those who are purified completely and have reached the purified stage of uh, devotional service, and those who are pure in intention. So if you keep pure in intention, you'll ultimately come to the stage of purified, pu purified in heart. <laughs> But if you do, if you're not pure in intention, then you this is then you slow down the whole process, and that's what Prabhupada is saying here. It's not purified by the contamination because they're still trying to fulfill material desires. I mean, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, four types of people come to me, and people who who want wealth who want freedom from material suffering, they're also, they also come. And they're also called Mahatma because they've come to the right place. But at the same time, once they come, they should understand that there is something better, something higher. And that, can, that should be experienced through the process of devotional service. And not simply to keep those desires. And that happens sometimes, people come and they have material desires. They can't fulfill them in a material way, so they come to spiritual life and try to fulfill them. They get some fulfillment, and then they go back to the material world again to try to live the material life. But, you know, Vishayan Venivartan Tenyaharasya Dehinam. 
when you get a higher taste, you can give up the lower taste. And even if you haven't got the higher taste, you should know the higher taste is available as long as you don't chase after the lower taste. <laughs> it's still available. You just have to work for it. It takes time, but it also it comes automatically to, if you're following properly. That's all. Do you have a follow-up question? Yeah, a follow-up question. When he wants to argue. In the sense, uh, <laughs> yesterday, Maharaj, you were uh, giving a talk on uh, cultivating friendships uh, amongst devotees, which is necessary. So, so what should we do? Uh, we should... Uh, uh, we are trying to follow the authorities and we are not trying to create our own, you know, trying to not feed in our material desires. Some devotees, so should we put eff efforts in cultivating friendships and caring and all those things or should we, you know, follow, you know, some uh, the sadhana process, you know, and uh, just be absorbed in our uh, sadhana and shravanam, kirtanam and everything will happen automatically, you know. Friends you will get automatically, all, all the things will happen. Well, it's automatic. You're, you're in the association of devotees, and you're serving, you're doing your sadhana, you're performing your, your prescribed duties. You know, actually, you'll make friendship with devotees automatically with them. Because you have to work together as a, as a, you know, as a yatra, as a community, as an ashram. So friendship automatically comes, or should come, like that. There's those who, who try to avoid that, but they're never happy. <laughs> because we get support, encouragement, purification from the association of devotees. Yeah, so it'll happen automatically. Just don't try to avoid it. That's, that's the whole thing. Very much for your class, wonderful class. I'm a Grahastha and I'm associated and I'm hearing uh, Bhagavatam, uh, Bhagavad Gita classes since many years. And uh, while performing I, my duties as a Grahastha and when I'm connected with like-minded uh, people around me, I feel that there are so many things for me to do, but I find challenging to, to uh, give justice to my desires to serve things. I have to do my duties as, uh, in terms of my job, to earn my livelihood towards my kids, uh, then my family, and then my social uh, obligations are kind of things where I want to contribute. But I'm not able to give justice to the, will, to the extent uh, I wish to contribute. So, I feel sometimes that I have got potential, but I'm not able to give justice to those things. Because of lack of time? Yes, primarily. Mm. Well, mm -hmm. so the problem is mm, you're doing everything nicely for your family, for your occupation, that's, everything is in line. But that, that social part, associating with devotees and taking more time for Krishna consciousness, seems to be not available, right? The time is not available, right? So, sometimes we say, well, maybe you are spending too much time in your personal needs. <laughs> or maybe you need someone to give you a, what is it called? A, uh, what do they call those people? Uh, expert time manager. <laughs> Maybe you need some instructions on how to manage your time better. Because <laughs> sometimes we see, we uh, take a long time to do something that could be done simply. Or we take on too many things and some of it is just really unnecessary. Or we just don't know how to manage our time and we don't know how... Prabhupada was... That was one thing about Prabhupada. He did so much, but he knew how to manage time. 
He was really expert at that. He had enough time for his personal needs and at the same time he also was able to travel and preach, write books and, you know, meet people. So he was an expert time manager. <laughs> and so he, and he learned that also through trial and error, but uh, you have to see, get some advice maybe on how to manage time. <laughs> and then there is four things. There are things that are essential, things that are important, things that are non-essential, and things that are not important. These are four categories of activities. Things that are essential, they're unavoidable. We have to do them. Things that are important, we should be doing them. If we miss them once or twice, that's, we shouldn't be missing them more than that. Always bring them back if we forget. Things that are non-essential, uh, we may do them or we may not do them. And then there's things that we just do that we, we just waste time. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm expert at wasting time. <laughs> I need a time manager myself. <laughs> but uh, because my life is simple, I have enough time for Krishna conscious. But with family responsibilities and job, which are required, then you have to see how to, how to do it in such a way as that you don't overdo it. <laughs> like that. Bhaktivedanta Thakur, he was a profi pro what is that word? Pro proficient, not proficient. What is that? Pro prolific author. He wrote so many books. And he also was a magistrate for the British Raj. He had a big position. And he had, uh, and he had a big family. But he was able to spend time with his family in such a way that the family was satisfied. They didn't want, he, he gave them t quality time and not just time. <laughs> so he knew how to do that as a, as a devotee. So try to qualitize our life somewhere where we, we put quality in everything we do and not just doing a lot of things. <laughs> so that takes some intelligence, that takes some, some arrangements, mm -hmm. advice from others. But it's available. <laughs> Time managing. <laughs> There's two good books, both written by Bhakti Tirtha Swami, called, what is that? Time Management, uh, Volume 1 and Volume 2, uh, Time Management, I think it's called, or something like that. Uh, and gives a lot of helpful hints how to, how to manage time as a devotee. Can't remember the names of the books, but it's available. Okay, anything else before we end? Thank you. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Simple living, high thinking ki jai. <laughs>